um, our, our father, Sean Morris, died one year ago yesterday. Uh, he had Alzheimer's disease and he had about 16 months of relatively good health at a nursing home, but then he got aspiration pneumonia, which is a common um, ailment for Alzheimer's patients where they forget how to swallow, or their brain forgets how to send the right message how to swallow. And uh, he was taken from his nursing home to Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge. And we got there right away, and um, I had a bad feeling about it, I, but the, the thought was, we'll treat it and he'll go back to the nursing home. But in a couple of days, the staff nudged us and said um, it was time for hospice care. And that was um, on, let's say, November 15th. And my mom, who was here tonight, she stayed with them um, basically around the clock the whole time. And my sister, Clelia, who lives in Madison, and my brother, Ian, and I were there uh, for long stretches of each day. And the night before he died, my mom went home to take a shower and get some sleep. And it was my turn to stay at the hospital that night, and um, we didn't want him to be alone, although it was a wonderful setting, I must say. Uh, about 5 o'clock that morning, on the 20th, um, a nurse put her hand on my shoulder and said, it's almost time. And you, you know, she said, you got to call your mom and call your brother and sister and tell them they should get out of here as soon as they can. Um, my dad, Sean, was raised Catholic, and he went to Catholic school and had plenty of mean nun stories to share. And I don't remember really ever having a serious conversation with him about our respective beliefs in God, but I assumed that he didn't. I mean, he sent me to uh, a church when I was like six or seven, the, the Church of the Christ Scientists, and claims I came home going on and on about Mary Baker Eddy, Mary Baker, or Mary Baker Eddy, and the Church of the Christ Scientists. I had a newspaper, which I was very proud of. Um, I went to a Presbyterian church, I went to a Jehovah's Witness church. I think it was all sort of a broad scheme on the part of my dad and, and maybe my mom to let me know what organized religion was really all about. Um, but um, uh, my sister's daughter, Natalie, uh, she went to Catholic school and in sixth grade my dad and I drove up to Madison where we were all from, um, well, kind of, sorry mom, um, uh, for her confirmation. And I was really struck by how deferential my dad was to the priest. Um, almost nostalgic of uh, being in the presence of a priest. That was very interesting to me. And so what, as I sat that morning it, very early with my dad in those waning minutes, hoping he'd hold on until everybody got there, uh, I, I watched the, the time between each of his breaths grew slower. And I wondered if he was dreaming. And I wondered if he was worried that there wasn't anything on the other side or that there was something on the other side. Uh, and he took his last breath at about 5.25 that morning. There's a writer I admire very much who has described what it was like being in the room um, the moment a dear friend of his died. And he said, there is no evidence of a soul except in its sudden absence. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, my, my dad's body was there, but his person, who he was, was most definitely gone. He was here one minute, and then he was gone. I'm an atheist, and I, I think I'm hardwired that way. But there were moments like that one where I wondered if I was missing something. And I know that religion brings a lot of comfort to people in moments of profound loss. And I felt right then by myself uh, that my grief toolbox was pretty empty. What I do know though is that the universe and earth and human life existed before any of us were born and became, and became conscious of it. And now that my dad was gone, he was back to where he started before he was born. He lived and he left his mark on earth, but now in that moment he lacked consciousness of his own absence or his prior existence. And I decided, you know, within that moment that I was okay with that. And I'm still very much okay with thinking of it in those terms. But within 10 or 15 minutes, my mom and my brother and sister arrived and they were all very distraught that they hadn't gotten there on time. And we spent some time comforting each other. And then the hospital chaplain arrived. Let's just say the mood changed. <laughs> Here is a person who is trained to serve others in their moments of grief who, who maybe would have answered my question or, or had his version of the answer to my question, of, well, where is he now? Um, but that wasn't what we got. We were, we were over-served with the chaplain service. 
Uh, hello, <laughs> I'm Pastor Larry of the Lutheran General Chaplain's Office. Are you the Morrises? Yeah, are you, are you a rabbi? Uh, no, I'm a cantor. Are you familiar with my faith? If you're not, I'd be happy to explain the difference. Uh, I said, well, my husband's Jewish. And then my mom said, and I'm a Semitophile. <laughs> well, I'd certainly be interested in learning about how one goes about becoming a Semitophile. And my brother said, Well, you know what Le Lenny Bruce says, in New York everyone's Jewish. <laughs> You're from New York? And my mom said, I'm from Goshen, New York. In the summers we used to sit on the hill overlooking Route 17 and watch the Jews drive up to the Catskills. <laughs> Well, that's the first time I've ever heard anything like that. And may I go so far as imagining that you would root for the occasional accident? But what the... <laughs> uh, since you're a nice family and you're from New York, I, I hope you don't mind me telling you a little story. Actually, uh, two stories. Uh, first of all, did you know that the, uh, that the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants were originally from New York? <laughs> yeah, my mother said, uh, my husband was a Giants fan. He never forgave them for leaving. <laughs> so, my first funny story is that, you know, the Mets colors are blue and orange. That's blue for the Brooklyn Dodgers and orange for the New York Giants. You know, Larry, um, I don't know if that's really a funny story so much as a fun fact, but anyway. My, my second story is in two, actually three parts. God. When I, was, when I was moving from my old congregation in New Jersey to my new congregation here in Illinois, some of my old congregants wanted to buy me a gift, and since I was moving to Chicago, they bought me a White Sox jacket. Now, you're National League people, as am I, and so I went to the store and returned the White Sox jacket intending to buy a Cubs jacket, but for some reason I went ahead and bought a Mets jacket. But then when I was on my way to Chicago, I realized I can't wear this jacket there. So I got to Chicago and I put the jacket in the closet. And anyway, it was summer and I didn't wear a jacket Larry, anyway. Larry, 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 is this the last part of the second story or the third part of the first story? I forgot. Fast forward nine months, it's Thanksgiving and, a, and members of my new congregation are giving me a ride to the airport. And I've got the jacket rolled up on my lap because they're lovely people and they're Cubs fans and I didn't want to insult them. So anyway, if we get to the airport terminal, I get out, and it's very cold, so I decide I'm going to put the jacket on. So I put the jacket on, and here's the punchline. A man walking by sees me, and he says, you've got a lot of nerve wearing that jacket around here. <laughs> so do you have any questions for me? Oh, is it my turn? Okay, okay. I don't know, I don't, I don't know, you're a cantor, do you, do you ever get annoyed when the kids talk during Bar and Bat Mitzvahs? Well, ours is a conservative temple, and you know that we forbid the use of electronic devices, and some, so I tell the children if they need to use their phones, they should step outside, and of course, when they step outside, sometimes the yarmulkes come off, and so I remind them of our tradition of covering the heads. And of course, the children will say, well, it just fell off. And so I tell them, you know, I have some thumbtacks in my office if you think that might help. Well, I hope I brought some comfort to you. And if, and if you need anything else, I'll be on my shift for another five minutes. Uh, uh, Take as much time as you need, 20 minutes, a half an hour, but do keep in mind we will be needing the room. Uh, so would you mind if we said a blessing? No? Uh, may I ask what you would like to pray for? And my mom paused and said, I don't know, death to ISIS. <laughs> And Ian said, uh, Peace of mind for my mom. <laughs> and my sister said, Yeah, that's what I was going to say too, peace of mind for my mom.
So I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm fucking gonna go with death to ISIS. <laughs> You know what? Let me be more general about that. How about just Larry? How about peace in the Middle East, if you will? Again, I couldn't bring myself to make this into any sort of spiritually religious moment. To Sean who's left us, may we pray for death to ISIS, <laughs> peace of mind for is it Wilma? And if we may be so selfish, for peace in the Middle East. <laughs> so we're still holding hands, and, and as you might expect, I didn't know where to look. And my mom accidentally leaned and hit the nurse's call button, and all of a sudden, a voice comes over Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? And my sister says, yeah, it's God. <laughs> She's a woman. <laughs> we all laughed except Larry, who said, I think there's a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> and the four of us standing there for the first time ever, each of, I'm sorry, but standing there for the first time ever, facing each other short, one of us, three adult children who had grown up with our father's laughter to the Marx Brothers, and Mel Brooks and Bullwinkle and SpongeBob SquarePants as a soundtrack to our childhood looked at each other and thought to ourselves, No, Larry, that was the joke. Thank you. Yeah.